What uh, stays the same from the time we come into the world until the time that we leave, leave it, no matter what? No matter what. What stays the same from the time we come into the world till the time we leave it? <laughs> this is going to be a good one. Good morning, guys and girls. August 3rd, August 3rd, looking at 1 Timothy, the young preacher Timothy. I'm telling you, you know, Paul wrote some of the greatest advice to young Christians when he wrote to Timothy telling him how to conduct his life, how to lead it, how to, you know, what to think about, what to do. 1 Timothy 6, 7, and it says, it says, we brought nothing into this world, we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. <laughs> That's what stays the same. We brought nothing into this world, we're going to take nothing out of it. All tournaments start with everybody at zero. We're not handicapped by any scoring system. We all have empty live wells. When that tournament kicks off, we all have an empty live well. Within minutes after takeoff, the standings begin to change. When we all took off, we're either all tied for first or all tied for last, whatever. But within minutes after we take off, the standings start to change. We all have a chance throughout that tournament to win or to lose. We're born into this life with absolutely nothing. And then within seconds, we're wrapped in blankets and, and we begin to acquire stuff. That's exactly right. We begin to acquire stuff. As a matter of fact, in today's world, before a baby is ever born, that baby has acquired stuff. As a matter of fact, I know a lot of grandpas, granddads that have bought a rod and reel for a grandson or a granddaughter before she or he was ever born. Now, I can't imagine people doing that. I've bought a few of them. <laughs> before they were ever born, they had a rod and reel. So they started acquiring stuff. In the United States, we have the opportunity to acquire staggering amount of possessions. But at the end of, the li end of our lives, we all leave with exactly what we started with. Nothing. Nothing. Sure, many people have been buried with mementos, jewelry, prized possessions, even money. But all that stuff remains in that box as we move on. Where we go depends not on what we own, but on who owns us, Jesus or Satan. Isn't that amazing? Think about that for a second. That's just like a, that's a pretty good situation right there. You know, we have so much stuff in this country. Um, even the people in this country that are living below the poverty line and considered by the worldly standards or United States standards as being poor, by most places in the world, in pretty much all of history, would have been considered and is considered wealthy. You take people that really think that they're poor in, in our society, in the United States of America, you put them in another country and give them what they have, and they would be extremely, extremely well off. You know, one of the stories in the Bible that I love the most is talking about the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler asked Jesus what he needed to do to be saved. And uh, Jesus told him that, well, just go and sell everything you've got and give it to the poor. And he went away troubled because he had many possessions. And that's always been a troubling verse to me and probably a lot of Christians because we think that, wow, is that, is that what we need to do? Well, that's not what we need to do to be saved. Obviously, we simply repent of our sins, believe in Jesus, ask him to save us, and, and he will. But we think about, well, we're not a rich young ruler, so we don't have to give away everything we've got, give it to the poor, and then go follow Jesus. We don't have to do that because we're not a rich young ruler. Have you ever thought about that rich young ruler, if he was to come back in today's time? Let's say that rich young ruler was to come back and come to your house or to my house. And, you know, he comes up to the house and... Uh, or we maybe we, we pick him up somewhere and he, he gets in the, get in our car and 
and we turn the radio on and you know he look he looks at our car and he says oh my gosh what a chariot i've never seen this kind of chariot like this this is like the most incredible chariot in the world and uh, we say oh you think this this is something this is an old junker man this thing i paid this off about four years ago made 72 payments on it this is an old junker and he said Oh, I've never seen a chariot like this. This is incredible. And you reach over and you hit a button, turn the radio on. He goes, oh my gosh, there's people in there singing. It's amazing. Oh, you, you, well, you must be the most wealthiest person in the whole world. And so we get over to our house. And we pull up to our house and we pull in the garage and we hit a button and a, and a door opens up. And he goes, oh, what is that? Oh, I, is this where you park your chariot? No, no, this is where we park my wife's chariot. I, there's too much stuff in there on my side to park mine. I got to park mine out here in the, in the driveway. Oh, your wife has a chariot. Oh, my goodness. And we go inside, we click a TV on, and we open the refrigerator. And I mean, what we have, all of us, is like probably beyond the wildest imagination of that rich young ruler. Probably beyond the wildest imagination. And as we are going through this situation that we are with this virus from China. I've been so amazed at how afraid the United States has got, and I'm sure people around the world are, are just as afraid as a lot of the people in America, about this virus killing them. And I've had several people comment on our YouTube channel and our Catch of the Day channel and our Facebook page, Jimmy, we're not any of us going to walk out of here. We're not any of us going to walk out of here. Now, if Jesus comes back, before we die, some of us are going to fly out. That's what we'll do. But none of us is going to walk out of here. And what we're going to take out is exactly what we brought in. And um, yet so many do not have faith enough to believe that God can protect them from that virus. And if they do get the virus, God will heal them. And if he doesn't heal them and they die from the virus, that God had it planned for them to die that day anyway. Scriptures tell us that we have an appointed time, an appointed time. So, but this is, this is so perfect for what we're going through nowadays. If we're going to trust God with eternity, we sure ought to trust him through this virus. Here's our tip for today. It's about tournament fishing. When you call during a tournament, mark the next two or three fish that you want to call. So mark the next two or three, like the smallest one and the next smallest one and maybe the next smallest one. Most of the tournaments that we fish uh, in the last several years have been five fish tournaments. So when, and I never mark the fish ahead of time. A lot of guys do. But, uh, but once you cull, then, and what I do, I use the, the, the little marking system. It's got the little uh, bobbers on it or little walls on it, and they're different colors. I use red, white, and blue. Uh, being patriotic, I use red, white, and blue. And so I catch my sixth fish, I'll throw the smallest one away. Then the smallest of those five, I'll put a red marker on. The next one I'll put a white marker on, the next one I'll put a blue marker on. So when I get in there, I can grab the, the marker that's red, pull that out, put a bigger, and if it's fish I've just caught, it's bigger than that, throw that fish back. So when you call, be sure to mark your next two or three fish that you want to call. And hopefully, you'll get to be marking fish all day long. Guys and girls, go out there and have a great one today. And remember, I love you.